Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where the Croods 2 is on the cusp of becoming the most successful pandemic film, domestically. There are asterisks everywhere these days, <laughs> but that's still a pretty nice feather, and not only the Croods, but also DreamWorks Animation and Universal's Cap. Now, you would think that during this pandemic, 7 million, that's the difference now between the Croods 2 and Tenet, would be an, domestically, would be an impossible desert to cross. Yet here's Uni and DreamWorks' tune sequel, still at number one in its 13th week of release. Although it only has one more week until Raya uh, and Spon well, Raya is the only one going to theaters, whereas SpongeBob will be debuting on uh, Paramount Plus. But it'll have, it'll be those will be other family films for people to see. We'll get to that in a moment. But I also want to point out that The Croods 2 is still in the top 10 over on iTunes. It's been on uh, PVOD since December, and it's still a $20 purchase. You'll finally be able to rent it for less than half, you know, less than half of that starting this Tuesday. Although who hasn't seen it at this point? It's been so massively popular. Have you not seen The Croods 2 yet? I'm curious. It's a great movie. Tenet, to be fair, is also still in the iTunes top 10 with much more aggressive pricing. While Wonder Woman 1984, and it's only its second weekend on PVOD at a $20 rental price, has fallen out of the top 10, which I think shows, I don't, you know, again, it's a little bit like the Mulan situation. I don't know if it's the business model or the movie that's at fault. I think in this case, it might be a combination of the two, but I think Warner Brothers sending these movies to PVOD in between its H the HBO Max window and the purchase digital purchase window might be a bad idea. I think it's maybe, you know, it's too much exposure. Although the Croods has been, you know, been, the Croods has been able to pull this all off. But again, it's, it's a very good movie. So is that it? What's Uni's secret? You know, I don't think it's so much Uni's release plan as none of their other pandemic films have connected like this, except Trolls, which is also a family film. So I think it's a family film which appeals to the biggest audience. You know, if you have a group of people, chances are everyone in that group is going to enjoy this kind of all ages family fair. Uh, and also, these are big brands. Uh, like The War with Grandpa did pretty well, uh, but at a much lower scale, you know, much more in the, rain, the, the realm of other pandemic films. But, you know, The Croods, uh, Trolls, and those are both DreamWorks, by the way. Wow, DreamWorks is like, woohoo, finally, we're back on top. So that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, but then also, there's no streaming component for these films. They're not available simultaneously anywhere else. Uh-oh! Uh, you know, Universal, about 17 days later, does make them available digitally, but only for purchase on PVOD. Well, it starts out actually at, uh, for um, a $20, 48-hour rental. So it's not even for purchase. And people are going along with that, even though they, were, they, were, they had price shock a little bit at the beginning. Uh, but people don't seem to be complaining about it as much anymore. So maybe people have gotten, the, 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 you know, consumers have gotten used to it. Uh, but with that, you know, so maybe Universal is a little bit to, you know, they are a little bit of the magic sauce. They deserve some credit for what they've done. Because, so with this in mind, we'll see if Disney's Raya can repeat Uni's success that they've had with Trolls and the Croods 2. Uh, I think the Croods 2 is a bigger hit than Trolls. Uh, Trolls, by the way, never went to theaters, as you might recall. So that's a little bit of a, a, an interesting difference as well. But Raya is debuting on Disney Plus Day and Date, although not at no extra cost. So we'll see what effect that has on its theatrical performance. And you know what? Considering how strong The Croods 2 is doing on PVOD at a much higher price point than Tenet, maybe it is the most successful pandemic uh, film overall. But we don't know because Universal doesn't release those numbers. You see, during this pandemic, Hollywood has taken the opportunity to retreat behind a veil of secrecy, arguing that since the OG streamers don't have to report any numbers, viewership or earnings, uh, you know, beyond their quarterly reports, and also, you know, they're talking about SVOD, where you just have subscribers, so you have, you know, the revenue comes off of subscriptions, not, you know, it's not an a la carte menu. Uh, but, you know, it's really changing the game. But studios are like, why do we have to report stuff? You know, why should we have to do it? The traditional studios, as they get into these new business models. And we're not just talking PVOD and streaming, because Deadline is pretty miffed that Searchlight won't report its box office numbers for Nomadland. I mean, I mean, 
Deadline's like, where could this lead to? It's, it's going to lead to us all just assuming these movies are horribly horrible flops because they're not being reported. So I don't really think this is a great long-term plan. But the theory the Deadline has, and I think it's correct, is that Searchlight decided, you know, this is Fox Searchlight, now called just Searchlight. Searchlight decided not to report its numbers because they're worried that they're so bad they will taint awards voters' views of the film. But I mean, come on, the Oscars have been celebrating unpopular films for years now. It's one of the reasons that the Oscar uh, telecast ratings continue to drop. Gone are the days when they, they you know, celebrated, and these films actually won, you know, movies like uh, Avatar and Glorious Bastards. Um, and Glorious Bastards didn't really actually win anything, but Avatar, uh, you know, The Blind Side, Titanic. Uh, um, Gravity, Sandra Bullock and James Cameron are very good for Oscar season. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you know, that's, you know, I don't think that would be a big issue. I mean, I think Nomadland has slipped a little bit. I don't think, I think Nomadland will be nominated a lot, but I don't think it's actually going to win anything because it's just not as good as, I don't think it's as aggressive or as competitive as the other movies. We'll see that. But what's more is that Searchlight, now a division again of Disney, where they're pretty shifty over there, uh, although everybody's getting shifty, uh, but that's why we're here to say, hey, you're being shifty. But anyway, they, uh, Searchlight won't release the post-track audience exit report either, which means we can't find out what audiences thought of the film. Uh, and CinemaScore didn't do an, uh, a grade for it either, even though it supposedly went wide this weekend, and it also went to Hulu. Did anyone watch Nomadland on Hulu or in theaters? But anyway, I suspect the middle of the country didn't care too much for Nomadland, which I would think would be the case. And here's where it also gets interesting, because usually awards fair can depend on the, the coastal elites to prop up awards fair films. They're the ones who go and see it and give it the high per theater average that makes the headlines. They give it the high scores when they leave and so it posts these great numbers. But awards films are, you know, are floundering when they just have to rely on the middle American moviegoers who are the ones uh, mostly heading out to the theater. You know, it's also, you know, even where you, you may have a mix of who's there, it's who feels comfortable going to a theater. Although, would they see Nomadland even at all? You know, would they even pay to go see it, much less grade it? I guess also, I would guess also no, which is probably hurting Nomadland as well. Uh, so yes, you know, awards fair depends specifically on, well, all urban markets, but very much New York and Los Angeles, which are both still closed. Now, earlier this past week, Hollywood and movie theater owners were hopeful that political problems for both New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and California Governor Gavin Newsom might lead to both of them opening theaters in a bid to win over popular support for both from both businesses and consumers, a little bit like the game both are playing with restaurants. But still, not even a murmur of any plans to reopen movie theaters theaters in the biggest markets, not even a discussion. New York theater owners are arguing that if Cuomo can open arcades, Dave and Buster sued, and the theaters are saying they're not suing because they lost in New Jersey. Remember they did that. They said, why go through it? Because we're probably going to lose. But arcades are opening at 25% and stadiums at 10%. So the theaters, movie theaters, are like, what about us? Although theater owners also said, well, if you're not going to open us at 50%, don't even bother. And you're like, but that's so much higher than 25 and 10%, and you're in a much smaller space. I mean, there are big movie theaters, but especially in urban areas like New York, there are a lot of very small theaters. So I don't think it's the same thing. And I don't think that movie theaters have good air circulation. Because for instance, people sit on airplanes for long periods of time, take their masks off to eat a little bit, I'm assuming. I'm, can you take a mask off to eat when you're on an airplane? Um, I'm, not, I'm curious as to what the etiquette is there. But airplanes have excellent air circulation and air filtering. Perhaps if movie theaters had taken the time to install top-of-the-line circulation systems you know, into their theaters, similar to the ones that are in, uh, in airplanes, they could be back in business. You know, They didn't want to build the drive-ins. They don't want to put the air, air, air filters in. They said they did, but then they had small print, and they were like, where well, we could. And it's like, and I think they felt like they didn't want to spend the money, but look how long it's taking. And you know, if they had just spent this money early on, maybe they could be. I mean, restaurants spend a lot of money to reconfigure themselves to be coronavirus uh, you know, responsible. Uh, so, I mean, I. I mean, they built a lot of outdoor seating areas that were technically indoor seating areas, but still, they worked really hard and spent an extreme amount of money to do that. But movie theaters have not done that. And so uh, th that's something they should think about. 
<laughs> while they continue to be closed. And I know some of you like to say there have been no reported cases in movie theaters coming from movie theaters, but we don't really know where anybody's getting infected from because so many states are fudging their numbers now, including New York City. So we just can't, you know, just nobody knows. Okay, now let's move over to top tens where we're going to start with Nielsen, which has become a, a, a routine for us, and I'm enjoying it. I, I like Nielsen putting some kind of perspective on what's happening with streaming. I don't 100% trust it, but I think it's a, it's a start. It's a good start. So uh, some of you are going to be upset about this, though, because uh, shockingly, WandaVision actually dropped down a spot in its second week with its third episode from six to seven. Woo! So, I mean, but remember, Paired Analytics was much further ahead in their analysis, you know, in terms of the timetable. So let's see what happens uh, when the MCU storylines start to kick in on the show. I think that this, but this, I think this does give us a, an idea that the sitcom angle didn't totally connect with the majority of audiences because it is it is slow out of the gate. I mean, dropping, dropping is weird. Uh, very weird. All right, so I'm very curious to see where it's going to rank in the next couple of, you know, as we get to the next couple of episodes. Uh, although to be fair, as I'm sure some of you are already pointing out down below, since this is done by minutes, you know, runtime, WandaVision episodes are very short and it doesn't have the, the, the runtime or the previous seasons to really help it be competitive here uh, because that's how Nielsen measures its top 10. So that's another argument, Disney and Marvel, for longer episodes. Uh, the rest of the top 10 for the week was all Netflix, so maybe they don't have to change anything. They're like, oh, we're fine. As for movies, Outside the Wire was number one was the number one streaming movie again in its second week. That's very good for Anthony Mackie. Everyone's getting in the mood for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, while so, I'm, I can't wait to see how different series from you know Marvel compete in the top ten each week. Because I think I'm very I mean, we didn't really see Mandalorian season one how it competed. This is interesting. All right, so anyway, we're, this is we're just getting started. Now, Soul, as you can see, also continues to do very well. And it's great to see the White Tiger on here because nobody talked about that movie and it was great, but at least people watched it. But people are talking about I Care A Lot, which trended top 10 on Friday when it debuted uh, on Netflix and is uh, the number one movie on the service. Uh, actually, number one content period on the service, which is very impressive. Rosamund Pike is Golden Globe nominated for her role, and this surge in popularity might really help it with its Oscar chances as well. And finally, get Rosamund Pike's more goddamn work. It is a mystery, a cruel mystery, as to why she didn't get more work after Gone Girl, where she did a phenomenal job. Fincher hired her. She was great. She's so good. And Kevin James, speaking of being good at something, he is very good at building a sitcom. And the crew, by the way, is also a joint venture with NASCAR, taking a page from the, uh, you know, wrestling uh, WWE's entertainment playbook to expand its reach, not only offering uh, more content to its fans, different, uh, different style content to mix it up, but also maybe reaching out to people who normally wouldn't watch NASCAR, but they love the crew and they're like, maybe we should check out a race. It's very smart. It's very smart. Uh, then on iTunes, Monster Hunter has finally found an audience. Did anyone watch it? What did you think of it? I thought it was pretty bad. But, uh, you know, it had its moments in the beginning, but then it just became bad. It made me want a Hershey bar, though. All right, and wow, people are really enjoying Barb and Star go to, to Vista Del Mar. Should Kristen Wiig, instead of, you know, for decades, she's been trying to be a serious actress, and it's kind of worked out for her, but you know, not, not, she hasn't had anything like this or br Bridesmaids and this. So it makes me feel that Kristen Wiig should really be focusing on following in the footsteps of Will Ferrell's comedic work. I think that would work very well for her. She should do more like this. Uh, I, think, I think viewers have spoken as to what they want to see from Kristen Wiig. And Dan Stevens continues to have you know, an audience, but yet not really just oh, be so close to being a star, but not actually being one. He's so good. I, he really, you know, I wish Marvel, Marvel or DC would hire him. He's really great. As for this coming week, Superman and Lois kicks off on Tuesday with a two-hour premiere. It's excellent. I highly recommend you check it out. Well, Punky Brewster returns on Thursday to Peacock. Will they have another Save by the Bell-sized hit with these revivals? Uh, Freddie Prince Jr. is on that show. Uh, I'm re-watching Friends on... Um, uh, HBO Max, as you know, and I got to the episode where he was the male nanny, and I was like, you know, Freddie Prince Jr. was a really good actor, so I'm, I'm very happy for him. Uh, Netflix has Gilmore Girls-inspired series uh, Ginny and Georgia dropping on Wednesday. Well, you know, they have a movie a week on Netflix. Well, this week they have three movies on Friday, but the twist is 
They're all foreign films. Then also on Friday, Cherry debuts on Apple TV. Rise and prepare, Tom Holland stands, because he's really going to need your help with this one. All right, so that's this week's movie map. The uh, embargo lifts on Thursday, the day before, just to give you some idea as to what they're expecting. All right, so anyway, that's this week's movie map. Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.